Remember when you learned how to find the derivative of the inverse trig functions? We did it by inverting the equation and using implicit differentiation. And then we got an answer in terms of y, and we used a triangle to rewrite it back in terms of x. And the amazing result was that when you took this transcendental function and differentiated it, you got this algebraic expression. Well, this has some interesting implications. For example, suppose I take this function, y equals a half inverse sine of x plus a half x times square root of 1 minus x squared, and then I differentiate that and simplify the result. The answer turns out to be a very simple algebraic expression. So the consequence of this is I can take all sorts of algebraic expressions and integrate them, and the integral will involve trigonometric functions. So the idea of trigonometric substitution is that you start with an, a certain type of algebraic form, and you actually turn it into a trigonometric integral, even though the original integral had nothing to do with trigonometry. And that makes it easier to integrate. Now, I don't blame you if you feel skeptical about this, because it's hard to understand why you would take an integral that's just a, an algebraic expression and, and seem to make it more difficult by turning it into a trigonometric integral. But this really works, and let me show you an example. For example, suppose we had the square root of 1 minus x squared. What you should notice about that is that it looks similar to this trigonometric identity, the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta equals cosine theta. And our skeptic is annoyed now that we're not using the absolute value sign that belongs there. But uh, it turns out since we're introducing the variable theta and we can define it however we want, we can define it to be in the first quadrant. So we can use that red identity as it stands. So the substitution that we want to make then is let x equal sine of theta. Now here's our skeptic again complaining that that was backwards. It is backwards from the usual way we make variable substitutions. Usually we do something like this. Let u equal, say, 1 minus x squared, and then we figure out what du is. So usually we define it this way because we're defining some variable u. And in this case, we're defining the variable theta, but we're saying it sort of backwards. We're saying let x equal sine of theta. So we're defining theta implicitly. And that's the way trigonometric substitution works. It's going to be backwards from ordinary substitution. But it turns out that backwards substitution is easier than forward substitution. Because now instead of having to figure out what du is and looking for the presence of pieces in, inside our integrand, all we have to do is differentiate this equation and we find dx. So dx equals cosine of theta d theta. And now here's the really great part where we use the red identity. The square root of 1 minus x squared equals cosine of theta. I can take these two pieces now and substitute them into the original integral. I get there's square root of 1 minus x squared. There's the dx and my integral becomes the integral of cosine squared theta d theta, which we already know how to integrate because we've studied trigonometric integrals. So the skeptic now complains that we're, we've got an answer in terms of theta, and what does that mean? We just made up theta. So we have to write it back in terms of x. And How do we do that? Once again, we use the triangle. The relationship comes from our definition of theta in let x equal sine of theta. So x over 1 is the opposite over hypotenuse. That's x equals sine theta. The Pythagorean theorem tells us the third side of the triangle, and now we get all of the trig functions, sine of theta, cosine theta, etc. We don't have sine of 2 theta, however, so I'm just going to use the double angle formula and rewrite that in terms of sine of theta and cosine theta, and now I can substitute in the information from the triangle. 1 half sine inverse of x plus 1 half times sine of theta, times cosine of theta, plus c. And that's my answer. So I've used this Pythagorean identity, but there are actually three different Pythagorean identities that we can use for trigonometric substitution. And they are, remembering that they're, they're only in quadrant one, they are the square root of 1 minus sine squared x equals cosine x, the square root of secant squared x minus 1 equals tangent x, and the square root of 1 plus tan squared x equals secant of x. Using those three substitutions, I am going to be able to find a, a trigonometric integral representing any integral with any
quadratic form inside of a square root. And it's a remarkably generally applicable method. So let's look at some examples. First of all, the integral of dx over x squared times the square root of 25 minus x squared. I want to make use of the 25 minus x squared. I want to turn that into something that looks like 1 minus sine squared theta. So since there's a 25, let's say 25 minus 25 sine squared theta, so that x should be 5 sine of theta. That will be my substitution. And then from that, I know dx is 5 cosine theta d theta, and the square root of 25 minus x squared is equal to, think it through, 5 cosine of theta. And if I make all of these substitutions now, then I get dx over x squared times square root of 25 minus x squared. And now it turns into a trigonometric integral. And if I simplify it, it's the integral of the cosecant squared function, which is a rather easy one because we remember that the derivative of the cotangent is negative cosecant squared. And now I have my answer in terms of theta, but I need a triangle to turn it back into an answer in terms of x. So I draw my triangle based on x over 5 equals sine theta, and I find the cotangent, and I've got the result. And you should, of course, you should um, differentiate that result yourself to double check that it gives the original form. All right, next example. Suppose I have the integral of the square root of x squared plus 5 dx. Looks like a very simple integral, but there's no simple u substitution you can use to make it possible to find the antiderivative of that. So, uh, this time, since it's an x squared plus something, I want to use the Pythagorean relation that involved the tangent, because tangent squared plus 1 is secant squared. So I'm going to use x equals the square root of 5 times tangent of theta. Then dx is square root of 5 secant squared theta d theta, and square root of x squared plus 5, think it through, it's square root of 5 secant theta. When I substitute all of that into this integral, turn it into a trigonometric integral, it just turns into 5 times the integral of secant cubed theta d theta. Oh, do you hate secant cubed theta? Well, you should probably just practice that one. It, remember, it's the integral of secant theta d tan theta, and you use integration by parts, and then you use uh, Pythagorean identity so that you've got the original integral in terms of secant cubed theta, and it becomes cyclic, and you subtract, and uh, then you have an integral of secant theta in there, which you remember is natural log absolute value of secant theta plus tan theta. So uh, make sure you remember how to do that. And then you need the triangle to rewrite it back in terms of x. In this case, the triangle comes from x over square root of 5 is opposite over adjacent. That's how you make the triangle. And from that, you can find the expression for the uh, secant of theta and tan of theta. And when you substitute them in, you get an expression in x. An interesting thing happens, by the way, that square root of 5 in the denominator inside the logarithm is just a constant multiplying the argument of the logarithm. And because of the properties of logarithms, you can just subtract that off and redefine the arbitrary constant. So you don't need those square root of 5s. And the simplified answer would be 1 half x times square root of x squared plus 5 plus 5 halves natural log of x plus square root of x squared plus 5 plus c. Now I really encourage you to differentiate this and see if you can do the algebra to simplify it up into the original form square root of x squared plus 5. That's a real adventure. So using these three Pythagorean identities, we should be able to integrate every expression that involves a square root of a quadratic like even even if it were the square root of x squared minus 16, okay, then we would say let x equals 4 secant theta, and then square root of x squared minus 16 equals 4 tangent of theta. So we could integrate any uh, expression that has a square root of a quadratic. Okay, you want to you want to propose 17. And you're thinking that's harder because it's not a perfect square, but that's all right. We know that there's a square root of 17 anyway. We just use x equals square root of 17 secant of theta. Oh, now you want to put in a linear term. 
you're right the the Pythagorean identities only involve x squareds and constants so you might think it's harder if you have a linear term but remember about completing the square x squared plus 2x minus 17 is x plus 1 squared minus 18 so you just use x plus 1 equals square root of 18 secant theta and it really is true that any integrals that have forms that involve a square root of some quadratic expression are going to be writable as trigonometric integrals and this is the method of integration by trigonometric substitution